Welcome to One Moment Wiser. This is Christy Bridges, and I have a friend with me today you are going to love. My friend is Cheryl Jennings, and she is known as the best friends, best friend of families whose children have special needs. Cheryl is a pioneer in being a mom with a child who had special needs that went unrecognized for a while. She pioneered at a time when doctors didn't listen to moms, when social services had nothing to provide, when the educational system and the, the medical system and our just general social system was not prepared to help a child with disabilities thrive. And Cheryl did not accept what doctors said. She did not accept that her son would not have a good, valuable life. She didn't accept that. She said, no, he is a human. He is loved and he will live and I will take care of him. And she and her husband together have um, taking care of him now for over 50 years. And in the process, she's learned so much that she has been able to share in um, how many books? Well, I've got two solo books, but I've been in 16 compilation books. And 16 compilation this is since uh, 2015. <laughs> yes. And Cheryl has had... Um, so many podcast interviews I haven't been able to keep up. She has her own podcast that's starting soon called Hope Build Conversations. And she's an international speaker and a coach for parents who are being caregivers and just need a partner. So Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today. I just, I love your attitude ever since I first met you at that was it the uh oh it was Toastmasters wasn't it years ago <laughs> and it's also and you, event. <laughs> yes and you know what you have always just been so joyous but also so practical so thank you for being here today oh thank you Christy for having me I just love getting to be with you and I love hearing your little bits of wisdom, you know, your moments that you share. And I appreciate you asking me to be part of your, your day. <laughs> mm, absolutely. So if you would, now I, you know, told a little bit of your background, but can you tell us a little bit about um, how this all started? How did you end up being a caregiver for over 50 years? Well, it came just like it does for most people. You're planning all these exciting things. You can't wait. Your first baby is coming and you're having baby showers. And at that time, we didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl. And the only thing people ask you is, what do you what do you hope to have? And I would, you know, a boy or a girl. And I just go, I don't care. Either one is great, you know, because you never think to say, I hope they're healthy. You know, I pray that, you know, everything goes good. Well, it didn't. And uh, the doctor that delivered him, uh, they had they couldn't find him when it was time for me to deliver. So one of the nurses decided that, you know, since they couldn't find him, they would just give me ether, knock me out. So I would not be a problem until they could get the doctor there. Well, I woke up two hours later as he had just been delivered, but they didn't tell me he did not breathe when he came out. And I didn't know that for another year till a friend of mine was going to him and she was pregnant. And I said, ask him how long before doctors checked the babies. And when she did, he said, who wants to know? And she said, well, my friend Cheryl Jennings does. And he said, I remember Blake, when he was born, we had to give him oxygen, but his APGAR reading was less than six. And, you know, he wanted to be about nine. I mean, on, on the way that they rate them, but they didn't do any precautions. He left town for two weeks, told me everything was fine. And four hours later, they brought him in to see me for the first time. And the nurse walks in and says, look, this baby has a temper and pinched him. And I thought, why are you pinching my baby? Well, he tried to cry and couldn't. And he turned red 
And she thought that was temper. Anyway, it long story, a lot of things happened, but Blake had a lot of problems. And every time we went to the doctor, which I have records every week, we were in there going, something's wrong. No, Miss Jennings, you're just a new mother. You don't understand. And they talked me down out of everything that I would say was wrong. And it took 14 months before we really found out he'd been having seizures. All these things we were describing, they would go, well, he's not doing that now. You know, so they didn't know what was going on. And he couldn't sit. He couldn't hold his head up. And most babies can do that almost as soon as they're born. But he didn't for uh, two or three years. So we held him a lot. And during that time, that's how we got to hug and kiss and smooch on him. And, you know, just enjoy trying to figure out how to help him. Yeah. There wasn't anybody we knew that ever did anything except keep their kids home out of sight. And that was what we had to look forward to. But I, you know, I go back and I think my grandfather had a surgery that went wrong when I was only 16. And mm -hmm. for 16 years, he was basically bed fast. And my oh. grandmother had to take care of him because they botched that surgery and put him together wrong. And then years later, my father-in-law died and my mother-in-law came to live with us. So we cared for her too. Mm -hmm. And then my father had a heart surgery that went wrong. And I was going back and forth trying to help with my mom and dad. And he lived for about 15 years as an invalid. So caregiving has been all my life. And so once I had Blake, you know, I would have never thought of doing anything besides taking care of him. That's just and I'm thankful I had those good examples of people in my life who we just took care of family. That was what you did. That's right. We just take care of people, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I, I was reading in your book, um, It Takes Courage to Be a Caregiver, and somebody asked you, how do you do it? And you you just wanted to say, well, you just you just do it. Um, we just fall into things sometimes. And I imagine even though you had already had experiences taking care of other family members. Um, and, and so you just did it right. You just this is my baby. I just take care of him. I would imagine. Were there ever times that you were like, is this ever going to get better? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it, I, I kind of go back to I read something one time and then I've made it my own little story. But mm -hmm. it's like you packed for a journey and you thought you were going to go to Italy and you learned some language skills and you looked at sites. You had all these things prepared to see and do. And and then the plane lands and you're you're not in there. You're in India. Oh, you gosh. The plane and you're like. This isn't where I was supposed to be. I don't know the language. I don't know where to go. I don't have a clue what to do once I'm here. I can't speak the language. I don't know what's, you know, where to go for anything. But what do you do? Okay, the plane left. You're stuck. That's where mm -hmm. you're going to be. And you back <laughs> either. Here's the choice that most people forget that they're making. Mm -hmm. You either make up your mind that you're going to have a good attitude about what happens or you're going to have a really sour, bad attitude. And I say you either become bitter or better in life. And that's because of our choices, our attitudes, what we're thinking, because it has nothing to do with our circumstance. It has everything to do with our hearts and our minds. You know, we make choices and those choices are what we're, we're dealing with. And if we make bad choices, we're going to have bad consequences. But the thing is, you don't have a choice about some things. And another thing that might help people, and I, I just, I want to wrap my arms around people who are stuck in, why me, Lord? Why did you do this to me? Right. So what difference does it make? Yeah. You're there. Why it happens has nothing to do with what you're going to do for the rest of your life. You make up your mind that you're going to deal with it, but why it happens, why not me? 
Who yeah. else should it be? Okay, it is me. So now I'm going to have to learn how to do something I wasn't planning to do, but I can. And when people look at you sometimes as a, a parent that has a, a child with a, something that they see is wrong, I mean, it's visible. It's not something that they think, oh, that's a behavior issue, like autism. You know, a lot of times it, they're acting out and parents, uh, I mean, other people can walk by and go, oh, he just needs to be spanked or something because they don't understand there's right. another problem going on. But for our kids, you may see the wheelchair and you may see a walker or you may see awkward gait, but people will look at you and say, well, oh, I could never do that. Oh, yes, you can. You deal with whatever it is that your your problem is. You don't choose them. That's right. They are what you are given to deal with in life. And, you know, it's it, it's just one of those things that I think God gives us the strength and we forget that that strength is there. Yeah. And so we don't tap into it. And when we realize that he loves us and he is there for us, but he doesn't take away everything that goes wrong in our lives. He just gives us the strength to deal with it. And he said, I'll be with you always, no matter what, you know, come to me. I will take care of you. Yes. And, you know, I, OK, so I'm going to rewind here because you <laughs> used an analogy that I love. Um, I can think of going to Italy and I, I dream of going to the perfume shops there, right? Because, oh man, love those big, bold fragrances. But yeah, you go to, you, the plane drops you in a completely other place. There's going to be something really cool about that place. Well, you dream of having you know, this bouncing baby boy that's, you know, you have all these ideas for, and then you end up having a, a child who can't cry, you know, who has physical yeah. problems, can't take care of himself. Oh, can he cry now? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he couldn't cry in the hospital, but when he came home, he cried night and day. We could not get him, we couldn't find any way to comfort him. But a lot of that was the, it was the uh, seizures. It was, de he was dealing with things he didn't understand too. And we didn't know how to comfort him. Right. We were reading books in the other room and being told it'll end in 30 minutes. So we'd wait, but it was hard. We'd be crying in one room while he's crying in another. Keep yeah. the temperature lower. Well, we do that. Wrap him up. We do that unwrapping would do that you know no matter what they said we were we were trying everything but he cried so much that by the time he was 14 months old i was about to break down mentally and emotionally i was just to the point i couldn't stand the crying anymore i would literally get out of bed and go, get in the car and start driving and we were in mountains in tennessee and one day my husband said when I, I went to ladies Bible class, he let, he loaded up Blake, took him to the pediatrician and walked in and said, either you find out what's wrong with him or you put my wife in the hospital and, and take care of her. They sent us back. Then that's when we finally got a diagnosis. But Christy, when we got the diagnosis, then mm -hmm. my parents were there with us and my mom and dad said we you know we prayed about all of this and then they said some of the wisest things to us they said no matter what happens don't let people experiment on him you know don't experiment in surgeries trying to change his brain or something but whatever happens the physical problems we deal with are never harder than spiritual problems and when you see people struggling spiritually those are the more difficult problems. And no matter how hard the problems have been in his life that we've had to deal with, that's always helped me a whole lot. And that was a long time ago that they told us that. But I've seen that. It's true. You know, if people don't have hope, if they don't know how to deal with, you know, the life situation, they're lost and they feel hopeless. And that's why I'm going to start that podcast and I'm working with somebody right now. We're going to do it soon. So they'll have to keep posted on my Facebook and LinkedIn. But um, 
it's going to be uh, just to encourage people because you look around in our country and in our world, we have so much crime that's out of control. We've got all these things that have gone wrong. And it looks like those that are doing wrong are the ones that get rewarded and the ones that live right are the ones being punished, you know, because they're having to pay the consequences of some of these crazy things they decide in the government to take care of people who don't want to work. Well, God always told us that we we need to work. I mean, he, he made man and he said, here is your job. And then, you know, later in, uh, I think it's in Thessalonians. He said, if a man won't work, neither let him eat, you know, because he wasn't there to just feed people and let them do nothing. He used the feeding as a way to feed them first physically so they could listen spiritually. It was never disconnected. And yeah. sometimes we think, oh, we just need to feed the homeless. Well, we need to help them learn how to feed themselves mm. and get them a job and let them work, let them do something. And they'll be happier people if they do that instead of living on the streets on drugs. And, you know, that doesn't look very enticing, you know, to have that kind of life, does it? <laughs> right. Well, and it definitely, uh, I think we'll take uh, that. That's a boy. That's a whole other topic we should talk about sometime. But that's going to take some businesses making space for um leveling people up, you know, for, for getting people to where they need to be, um, business wise, which that's all, that's a, I really appreciate that topic. And I do want to talk more about that. So you were, um, but anyway, your analogy made me realize there have been a lot of moments of joy. So you had to finally, gosh, 14 months, you know, the doctor finally figures out, yes, there's something wrong. And and you were at a point where you couldn't take it anymore. So you had to find a shift. And along that shift, you found a couple of things. You found joy in um, this precious act that you were doing and in this precious life that you were taking care of. And you also found help. Mm -hmm. So you, um, this book, one of the key things that I got out of your book was just the loneliness of caregivers. You interviewed so many people. And one of the key things was, you know, everybody disappears. We can't go out and hang out. Right. And um, people don't know what we need. They don't come over, you know, to just say hi or, or, you know, to help. But you actually did. You started because you're a good communicator. You started having people in your life who would come over. The story of the two ladies who showed up with toilet brushes <laughs> came to clean your toilet. Now, you know, not a judgment, but you know, I think we could all probably go, oh, you don't need to do that. I'm gonna want to do that. Right? Instead, you laughed about it and went, hey, you know, let's do that. Because people like knowing there's something they can do. People and it wasn't a big, it wasn't a big job. Yeah, they didn't stay very long, but that just has, that's lifted my spirits. Even yes. telling about that because at the time I was like, oh, no. Uh, they said we know your husband ain't gonna do it, and we know your kids aren't gonna do it, so we're here to do it. And yeah, then the ladies were raising that, other kids, but they were all too small at that time. Well, and the lady from uh, church that said, "Honey." Mm -hmm. you're always ready to take care of other people. So I'm going to help you. And she said, I'll come and change your sheets every Friday. That is that was just a wonderful thing that because when she came, we worked together changing bed sheets, but then she was teaching me things. Mm -hmm. She was sharing a lot of wisdom with her, you know, her conversations and we miss that when and you hit the nail on the head caregivers will tell you the number one problem and this is the number one problem for moms that have special needs kids mm -hmm. people disappear yeah and i've had young ones say why are, why don't any of my friends call anymore you know and they're hurt yeah. and one of them uh, not long ago asked me that and i said well honey okay if you this was reversed 
and they had the child that was special needs, what would you say to them? And she said, I don't know. And I said, that's why they're not there. They don't know what to say. And instead of saying, I don't know what to say, or I'm here and I love you and, you know, anything, is there anything I can do? They don't know how to think in those terms. And a lot of it's selfish thinking, but they just walk away from it and think, oh, if you don't have time, I'll get a friend that does have time. And mm, that's so you. true. Oh, Ever oh, since you, you know, it's not just sibling rivalry when you have a special needs child. There's a little relationship rivalry all around a spouse who doesn't feel like they're needed um, because you devote all your time to this child when in fact you really need that spouse you know you just don't have the bandwidth to give them what they're used to the friends who who figure well you don't have time for them so they go out and hang out with other people you know there's a lot of that misunderstanding that causes broken relationships and you know sometimes I think when we're in a situation where we're trying so hard to handle things, we can't even push people away a little bit. You could have told those ladies with the toilet brushes, uh, not right now, you know, or, uh, I mean, you, you did try to say, oh, I don't really need it, you know what I mean? But you allowed that. The lady with the bed sheets, you allowed that. And that, uh, that gives people a way that they feel like they can be part of your situation, like they can enter in and participate with you in life because don't we really just want to do life together well and you brought up a good point because when i had a major surgery my sister came and she was sitting with me and I, you know i was young and she was sitting there and she said cheryl when people ask you if there's anything they can do don't tell them what you usually say oh nothing ah. because when you do that you have deprived them of a blessing. And That's I thought, I had not thought of it that way. You know, I was thinking about me, not them. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of our, our, I don't know if we're ingrained in thinking that way, if it's selfish, if it's handed down. I don't know how we get to that point that we think that, but we want to feel strong. We want to feel like we're in control, that we can do things. And, you know, that's another point. When things happen in a crisis, keep in mind, you're not only dealing with a crisis, you're dealing with a lot of emotions of everybody involved, even if they're not directly, they may have something to say about, you know, oh, you should do this, oh, you should do that, you know, a lot of emotional baggage that's going on that makes it hard too for people to know what to do. But the sad thing is I've talked to some people who said, you know, I was a CEO of a company and all of a sudden I got a call to come to the hospital and I found out I never went back to work. But then they resorted to drugs and alcohol because they didn't know how to cope. And I think people have got to learn how to go to God. They've got to learn that God is there for them. He did not abandon them and cause the heartache. He allows us to do that, or to go through it. But he knows that we're going to build our strength from the things that come to us. You know, he says perseverance is going to bring about our strength of character. Yeah. And if we don't have that ability to go through these problems and learn how to deal with it, then we're crippled as a person in our character. Well, you know, in our adolescence, Part of our natural development is we go through a period of, well, we do it several times as we're growing up, of discovering self-efficacy, self-reliance. Um, and, you know, we when we're babies, right, and then we learn to brush our own teeth, and we don't want anybody else to do this, you know, to feed us or brush our teeth. We want to do this for ourselves. When we get into adolescence and we start caring about how we appear to others and um, we want to, you know, don't want to be babied anymore. We want to do it ourselves and, and we want to come across as capable um, and be treated like an adult. Right? right. And so those things are natural, but we have to realize as grownups that those things were a natural part of being a child. 
And as grown-ups, we still want, you know, to do the things that we reasonably should be able to do, right? You don't want to be 32 years old and have somebody change in your, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> you don't want to uh, have other people paying your way if you can, you know, work for yourself. There's There are things we should take care of, but we also have to... Um, let go a little bit of that resistance to being helped and remember that community is so healthy right. and being willing to you know the the law of reciprocation people in relationships want to feel like they can give something because you give value to them they want to give you something right just by by speaking into their lives you know they want to be around you and they feel better if they can do something with you. So, so it is really, I want to just emphasize that for anybody who's watching right now, that if you're in a situation where either you're caring for someone else or you're dealing with your own physical or mental or emotional crisis, allow people um, practical ways to help you. Even if all you tell them is, you know, when they say, what can I do for you? And you just say, can you just listen for a minute? Cause I just need to let this out. Or can you take a walk with me? You know, even if it's something simple, give them something that they can do instead of saying, no, I'm okay. No, I'm fine. Cause, um, that won't become true <laughs> if you deny where you really are. Um, you know, you were talking about leaning into God. We blame God sometimes, but here's the deal. He clearly values our experience here differently than we do. Uh, it's not about become, you know, achieving all your childhood dreams, um, getting all the money, getting the perfect everything, right? It's about getting the perfect character. The character that he's developing in us because this is this much of an eternal experience. And if we can see that we are eternal, even if this lasts the rest of my life, it's not forever, but it is developing something that God sees as valuable and it can develop my relationship with God if I allow myself to lean into him because he is the giver of comfort. He is the giver of strength. He is the one who knows what resources to provide you and, and how to connect you. Um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, it says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And um, I just, just, and we need to hang on those words. Yes. Because we have a lot of weakness and we have more than we'll allow others to know about sometimes because we struggle with, you know, things that are, are personal and our character, the things we think about. And yet he knows it. He knows what those thoughts are. And he says, we'll be judged on those thoughts. Well, I mean, this is something that we can't comprehend very well because Everybody doesn't know every secret that you've thought or every secret thing you've done. And Amen. yet <laughs> God does know all of those, but it's a way of helping us to be better, not scare us away from him. Does that right. Make sense? Exactly. Because instead of denying it, trying to hide it, running from it, we can say, Lord, I am struggling with this. Right. Thought I am struggling with this attitude. Um, and I want to shift. You um, have so much joy and it's because you've chosen to focus on the, the joyful encounters that you have and the, you well, know, Philippians, they, yes. they have joy, you know, and how many times does Paul say to be joyful? And yet here was a man who had you know, been terrible before he became a Christian. He was killing and putting people into prison for their beliefs. And yet once he was uh, converted and God was using him, he had something wrong that he, it was called the thorn in the flesh. And he said, you know, I have to deal with that. And he said, I've prayed three times that you take this away. 
but God didn't. It was something he said, okay, whatever your will is, is going to be mine. And that's all he asked of us is to say, whatever your will is, and we'll deal with these things. And it's hard to turn loose. And I think that's part of our problem. We, we want to feel like and look like we're in control, even if we're not. You know, we just don't want to feel helpless and we don't want to look helpless. But uh, you brought up a point about telling people what you want as friends and neighbors and people in churches. Why aren't we saying, oh, I know you're home all the time. Can I come over and just sit and visit for an hour or so once a week? Or can I sit and read to your husband or your child for an hour and let you just go be by yourself to have a little time alone? Or can I mow your grass? Can I pick up the leaves? Can I and offer a specific thing that you feel like you can do? We can't all mow yards, but we can do, we can sit and we can listen or we could read to somebody that's there and give that caregiver the time they need to just have a little time for themselves. Plus, one of the most important things, Christy, that we've got to encourage caregivers to do is take time for yourself spiritually, but time to relax a little bit. And if you have a problem physically and you need to go to the doctor, go. Don't say, well, I'll do this later mm -hmm. and go on and take care of yourself because 67% of caregivers pass away before the person they're caring for. And that's incredible. If you're over 70, which many older people are now that are husband and wife caring, one of them is caring for the other, you'll pass away 70% faster than the one you're caring for. Why? Because we neglect ourselves thinking Oh, it'd be selfish for me to go to the doctor. She really needs me to be here for her. Or, you know, he needs something all the time and I'm afraid to leave him or somebody else can't do what I'm doing. No, you need to get over that and take care of yourself. And I did not understand that when I was young. And I just pushed and pushed and pushed until my health broke down. And that's when I could no longer lift my son, care for him. I had to be cared for for a long time. And that's one reason I'm out there telling other people, learn how to do the things that we weren't taught. Let's make it easier for you to do that than what we experienced because now we know better. And it's yeah. an education process of teaching people, you know, what they can do for somebody else and not just look at them like, oh, I'm glad that's not me or, you know, poor so and so look what they're having to deal with, you know, think of something that you can do and send notes, call, check, text. I have a friend I've never met in person. And when my son was having those surgeries, he was in the hospital 10 weeks and, you know, near death all that time. I was getting texts from her. Are you taking time for yourself? Are you relaxing? Are you getting away a few minutes just to take care of yourself? And those constant reminders made me know somebody was watching, I mean, thinking of me. That helped me so much. And we're still good friends. And we've not met and would love to. <laughs> Why are we tied down to different people? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you were talking about um, taking care of yourself because, because so often caregivers end up needing to be taken care of right i mean six weeks if if we and not put up not pointing fingers but i'm going to use this situation as something to think about if we consider ourselves the only persons capable of taking care of this person oh nobody else could do the job i do or he needs me so bad uh, that we refuse to take care of ourselves then we end up in a situation where not only does someone else have to figure out how to do the job we were doing because we didn't teach anybody, but they also have to take care of us. So now someone's doing double work right? because we weren't responsible for this body. And um, so we can be, you know, we need to shift our perspective on that. It's not selfish. Right. It's 
it's business continuity. And, and, you know, in the corporate world, they call it business continuity. You teach somebody else to do your job. You involve somebody else in your job so that you can load share. And, um, and it doesn't have to just be one other person. You know, sometimes one other person may not be as capable. But if you load share among people, you know, hey, everybody can take a part, takes a village, right? Then you actually can find those ways to to take a little time for yourself and and get what you need so that it doesn't become a month and a half crisis or a death right um but we also need you were talking about those the other people the people who aren't having to be caregivers and it makes me think of the concept of tithing our time uh, we as a church are you know, aware that if you, if, if you get a paycheck, right, that's a job God gave you. That's an opportunity God gave you. And he gives you the skills to do it. Well, you take some of what you got and you put it into God's work. Right. You ask God, you know, where do I put this? You, you put it into your church, you put it into ministry. And God knows that if he can get it through you, he's going to keep getting it to you, right? If God knows that you're going to pass it on, he's going to keep blessing you so that you continue to, to do that. Well, we live such busy lives that we don't always leave enough space in our time to tithe of our time. The same concept applies. If there's someone you know who is, uh, you know, sick or needing help or caregiving and you have already arranged your weekly schedule or your monthly schedule to have a little extra to give to wherever God wants you to give it, then you're able. And even though it may seem impossible, God will give you what he knows your share. God will give you what he knows you'll use for his glory and his work. So let's consider doing that. I love that, Cheryl, that you mentioned, um, you know, people just coming over and visiting, just spending a little time, just asking how they can help. We, we can all use the encouragement to add that. Now, for someone who currently, Cheryl, is, is almost at their wit's end, uh, you know, this is a new experience or this has gone on way longer than they thought. And they do feel all alone. Maybe it's the person whose spouse has already left because they felt neglected and, and didn't understand how badly they were needed. Maybe it's the um, you know person who's who's ended up all alone. Right. How how can they find a little time? What what do you recommend? Well, and that's you know that's an individual thing. First, let me just say. If somebody's struggling out there, mm -hmm. you can write me at Cheryl helps me at gmail.com. I will try to help you find some resources. Sometimes there's supports online that would fit what somebody needs to have somebody to talk to, but also um, help them find what's happening in their lives that's keeping them from being able to have relationships with others or having the time they need. And it's so individual. If they want to write me, I'd love to just help them figure out, you know, what's going to be the road they need to go. And um, there's just so many things out there that I, I think of a, a man that had me come to California to speak one time, and he was a single man. He said, Cheryl, I'm the one that everybody in the family says, well, you've got time because you're single to take care of his aunt. He said, I can't get other people involved in doing this. And I said, have you asked anybody to, to help you? And he said, no, I just thought that they know I, I need help. Well, that's part of the problem too, is that we think people can read our minds, see how busy I am. They all know what I need. No, we want mind readers. We don't know what each other needs. I mean, you got groups like AA for people that have an alcohol problem. Those are kind of private. 
they don't want to go broadcasting to the world they're struggling with. Well, that's what most people are. If they're struggling with something, they're thinking, you know, I know old people a lot of times, they have to say, oh, I've had a hard day taking care of my husband who handle it. Because you may think, I don't love my husband anymore. No. Those are thoughts that we have that we think other people are thinking. They're not thinking that. They're not thinking about us. So we need to focus on who's available. And it may be a minister. It may be a coach. It may be somebody that is in our lives. We just have to ask, do you have time to come over and have a cup of coffee? Or do you have time? just to spend an hour with me. I just need somebody to visit with. And when I was taking psychology course and uh, when I went back to school, they said that if you had one person that you could talk to, you wouldn't need a psychologist. One person, one friend could make the difference. But and sometimes me. <laughs> it's what yeah. I was <laughs> Sometimes for, for bigger issues, you, you need a few friends, right? Load balance, so you're not wearing somebody out. Um, but yeah. Cheryl helps me.com. I love that. Oh, Cheryl coaches.com is the website. And yeah, um, Cheryl, yeah. Cheryl helps coaches. I try to make it simple so people in there wonder it's H E R Y L Cheryl coaches.com. And I've actually got information there people are struggling with caring for a parent or somebody they can go on there and get a free thing a free pdf download if they want to know the top problems that parents have that have special needs kids is that and then then put another little gift on there that is finding the hidden talents in your child because sometimes special needs kids are overlooked in what they can do because they're always teachers and doctors, everybody focus on what they can't do. And they try to spend so much time correcting that. And it's not always possible. Sometimes I don't have brain mapping to learn time and money. And so they can get help. That is so smart. Okay, so Cheryl, you are, um, I'm, I'm getting a little audio interference. So I'm just going to reiterate what you just said, because Wow, people don't think about that always. We spend so much time trying to teach basics that this special needs child may or may not need or may or may not be able to grasp when in mm -hmm. fact, we might need to find out what their talents and gifts and interests really are because our God has made each of us so unique with so many facets. A person is not just their disability. Right. A person is not just a project or a problem or a thing to take care of. A person is a person with color and, and vibrance. And when you look for, you know, what interests my child, what keeps this child's attention, what right. is this child uh, capable of doing? And you start to celebrate that and nurture that. There, there is the part of, I'm sorry, but this gets me excited. There's the landing in India, right? There's the, where you start to really see the joy of where you are, the joy of the situation you're in. Um, I love, there's a picture. Is that your son that is, um, I think it was on your website holding a violin or or who who was that? You no, know, but he's the paintbrush. <laughs> oh, he okay. Paint and they oh. use that to teach him the range of motions with his arm. Give him a yeah. big hard paintbrush he in the house. And he started painting and people wanted to buy everything he did. And pretty soon he was able to decorate 14 Southern Dell clinics in Houston. He had work in at Texas A&M. They honored him as a special artist. Then he's got work at 
the University of Washington Medical School. Mm -hmm. I would have never dreamed that. And when people found he could paint, somebody said, why don't we have his art in our local museum? I was so excited because I was just thrilled. I didn't know how it happened. So I lifted the car, took him and another young man that helped us care for him, took him down to the place where they had worked with him and said, how'd you do this? And I wanted to watch them. And you know, it was not that anybody helped, but as he did it, they would have to blow their eye to keep from warping paper. There were some things they did that were not involved in the picture, but made it possible. And then, you know, met it in front of, well, we got to put it in a uh, museum. He had 78 paintings. People here, like the, you know, curator was like, I don't know why we're doing this. Nobody knows who this is. And was said, disabled. Well, I guess what? 200 people show up for that opening. Some had driven for different states, seven different states were represented. And some of them came because they saw him, hadn't seen him in 17 years, and thought, Blake, he can paint? I can see this. He sold 30 paintings the first day, and the museum was like shocked. She sold oh, 30 oh, paintings at his very goodness. first art show. <laughs> oh my goodness. We both never known that. And there was something that happened that was inspired for a while, and they can't do it because there's nobody and, that has the time to sit and work with him anymore. But those are treasures. You know, the pictures yeah. he did were treasures to think. He did this, and I've some in the house. I'll just look at all the time, but I think about it. And, you know, we see things that I don't know if he knew what he was painting. I have no idea. We're seeing birds, we're seeing angels, we're seeing hello, and our wildlife refuge out there. And when people say, oh, look, you can see someone, oh, you can. That's so amazing. And it, it just brings a lot of joy. But the first thing he ever did, I remember, was a little toy that Fisher Price it had a little dowel rod, and then it had a wooden little. Oh, you're frozen. Okay, so we're having some technical issues, but um, I love that. So, a range of motion exercise. Um, teach him range of motion he used painting and that ended up with him having paintings in all these dental offices in a museum with an art opening that sold 30 paintings <laughs> and it was just a simple exercise that lit him up that's beautiful oh good you're back all right oh, <laughs> well, what i was saying is just take the smallest little thing that they do and find a way and celebrate we celebrated the tiniest little thing, like was the biggest event that ever happened. Every time he did, I mean, it was so exciting. But you know what? It brought us so much joy when our other daughters were born because we think of all things we would have accepted as normal. We were thrilled with everything they do. So, you know, find the joy in watching your children, even if they don't have disabilities, find that they're good and encourage them and try to make them into what it was you being. Yes, because oh, yeah. as human beings, our hearts want to be, you know, we talked about that self-efficacy when we're, you know, as we're growing. Well, it doesn't matter if we have disabilities or if we you know, have different abilities than somebody else, we still want to be good at something, as good as we possibly can be at something. That makes us light up. It makes us feel good. And so you don't look at, at what other people are doing. Right. Don't look right. at, you know, look at what this child, what your child is doing and go, I see where you're coming from. I see what's in your heart. You know, do that again. Explain it to me. Show it to me. Do more. Um, you know, not in a pressure way, but in a wow, 
this is a neat side of you and I'm so glad to be a witness to it. Thank you. I love that you did that. And you did. You had several more kids and that must have been interesting. Uh, we have a we have a little while left. Tell me about uh, what it was like raising multiple kids when you had um, you know, a situation where that demanded a lot of your attention. Well, one of the things is to enjoy each one. Don't try to make any of them like the others. Enjoy the uniqueness of a child. You know, in Proverbs, it says, raise a child in a way he should go. Mm -hmm. And that way is different for each one. <laughs> I have never heard anybody say that before, but oh my gosh, you're exactly right. Raise up a child in the way they should go. Train up a child in the way they should go. And that way is different for each of them. Oh. These are different people. You know, it, the, you know, we had one daughter that was just bouncing for a minute and just joyful. I mean, it was just so much fun to watch everything, but she was in trouble a lot. Well, I, I had to take her out of church drag my wheelchair out with her son, I would thank her and he would cry. <laughs> so, you know, then there were so many free things. And I was trying to teach them the books of the Bible one time and, you know, he would listen to what he was doing and, you know, uh, I was teaching him. He couldn't speak very much, so it was hard to understand everything. And, you know, Janice S is very number. Do wrong to me. Joshua and our little girl was three and she went, oh, Joshua. Joshua, Melissa, and the first started and all the kids at church. <laughs> so he's doing the books of the Bible and she takes off and does the kids at church. That's great. He when he was little and he couldn't sit up, he was laying on the floor a lot. She was a baby and in the diaper sucking her. She would watch him and study him and walk around and study. Well, she started sitting down on his foot and he would go, uh, uh, And one of the ladies that had was there visiting that had a daycare situation said, don't push her off, don't take her off. Make him learn how to take care and defend himself. Well, he did. Then he said, she told me this, and I thought, this is brilliant. Other children can be their best teachers. Encourage them. Don't let them feel left out. Explain sometimes that they do take more time, but how smart they are and how they're teaching. And she would, she would make tea parties in the hall, and they would pretend things. And she was his, she was his thought, and she'd say, "Come on." And when I, I broke foot, and I was in a cast, and here she was, just little, and we'd be told, "Don't, don't help him sit up," like you know, because the only way he could sit up was like a W. Well, I couldn't do anything about. It. She could put him to sit up like that, and then she would say, uh, "Come on," and he learned to hop. He had to put his hand down, you know, his right hand didn't do anything, so he would put one hand on top of the other, and he would bounce and hop, and she just looked at him and said, come on, Rob, <laughs> and he followed her everywhere. He was like, he was like, he was like, he was like, my foot. You know, he learned to get around, and he was happy. He giggled, hopped around the house. She'd get him in the closet, and we'd hardly be to unroll him to get him back out. They play. Just enjoy every child you have for the uniqueness and thank them for what they do for the other child. And that's the best thing I can say for, for helping. It. Don't ever let your siblings feel left out because they're wonderful, too. And they bring you so much joy that they don't need to be frightened. I love that because I can see myself in that situation where, you know, you were told, you know, not to help him sit up or, or things like that. 
and you know she sits on him and and he's like oh you know and i could see myself in that situation wanting to rescue him and tell her that oh no you can't treat your brother like that and you know basically treating him like he's this fragile egg and and since you had a broken foot you couldn't just race over there and interrupt them and your friend wisely told you that she's going to teach him some things and this this she little is. girl of yours who is younger than him um taught him to you know to move and express himself and to and he had fun with it instead of being treated like he was fragile and put on a shelf he got to really have fun with his sister i you know that's uh, hmm, god is so much smarter than we are <laughs> God is so much smarter than me. I'm 51 years old. I have learned something from a three-year-old little girl. Uh, that is beautiful. That is just beautiful. So I tell you, they, life can be fun. And I tell people, you've got to enjoy the funny thing that happened as well as the hard thing. Have yeah. humor and hope and enjoy yeah. the journey, you know, because... It's going to have its ups and downs, but don't forget that humor. Don't, you know, go don't forget that humor. And yet, just feel like, well, this is a new thing today. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh, this just makes me so happy. Well, Cheryl, I have so enjoyed talking to you. If you want to reach out to Cheryl, go to cheryl dash coaches.com c-h-e-r-y-l dash coaches c-o-a-c-h-e-s dot com and if you want to email her it's cheryl at cheryl helps me dot com and this book right here is full of insight from from lots of different caregivers cheryl especially but even others that she's interviewed but it's also full of very very practical tips cheryl really has been a pioneer in um, obtaining services that are needed to take care of her son. And instead of um, living a very short life, the, the doctors predicted he's 52 now because Cheryl is, um, you know, made sure that her son got what he needed. And she learned to make sure that she gets what she needs as well um, to stay healthy and to stay you know, we're, you know, strong. So Cheryl, thank you so much for being with us today. And you, I think you have a favorite verse that you put in your email. Romans 8, 28, all things yeah. work together for good of us that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If we love the Lord and understand that everything that happens is not good, but it will work good, it's a big difference, but things do work out. And I can look back and I can see how things were so hard for us to go through. God worked out for good. Those things turned out to be a blessing, and not just the heartache that we felt at the time. It turned out better. So, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And I think this is part of my journey, you know, is hearing things Maybe help other people live it. It's from a book. And I interviewed 150 characters for that book. But to learn from others who've been there first what, we, what lessons that they learned so that we can make some changes and get better for the future, future people. We need that. Community development, right? God, God knew the beautiful person that you would become and that that you would the character that you would have and the way that you would be able to to build a whole community of people who who support each other and share ideas and make this world a better place and this is not something you would have planned for yourself but what a wonderful thing thank you so much Oh, well, God bless you. Me. You have a wonderful day, and I will see everybody next time. Bye. Oh, I just love you so much. You are. <laughs>